Hi, welcome to our lecture about cells. So today's lecture will all be all about cells. Remember from our previous lecture, we talked a little bit about cells. Um, cells are the smallest unit of life um, and all life is made out of at least one cell. Okay, and also, this is also a review, there are two types of cell, two basic types of cell. There are prokaryotic cells that are very, very tiny and structurally simplistic with no organelles. Um, and these are bacteria and archaea. And then the other type are eukaryotic cells. They are larger, so cell small. Uh, they are more complex, they have organelles. And we find uh, eukaryotic cells in animals, plants, fungi, and protists. Organisms that, have, that are made of a prokaryotic cell are called uh, prokaryotic organisms. And organisms that are made of eukaryotic cells are called eukaryotic organisms. All right, so what we're going to do today is talk about what's inside of these cells and what those things do, okay? We are gonna first start out talking about uh, components or items that are found both in prokaryotic cells and in eukaryotic cells, okay? And here are those five components. Notice I'm not saying organelles, because why? Prokaryotic cells do not have any organelles. So these guys don't have any organelles, whereas these do. However, they still do have five basic things in common. Okay. Uh, one particular note also um, is that I don't expect you to label diagrams in this class. I'm not going to test you over that. Instead, you're expected to learn uh, the structure and function of each of these. Uh, specifically the function or the job. So that's what we'll be focusing on for this lecture. It is of course helpful um, to have a diagram and to be able to identify it just to make you know a picture in your mind, um, but that's not really the point. Okay, so we're gonna go through these five, plasma membrane, cytoplasm, DNA, ribosomes, and cytoskeleton. All right, the first of those five components is the plasma membrane. And this of course is the thin outer coating surrounding the cell. Uh, I showed you this uh, diagram here uh, during the second lecture, um, and then here is a bacterium that's circled. So it's just the outer part of the cell. Um, it has some important jobs. So first of all, it defines what is cell and what is not cell. So cells need to remember maintain organized complexity, and one way they can do that is by making a barrier uh, between themselves and the outer world. Okay, it also acts as a gatekeeper and gets to decide what goes into the cell and what goes out of the cell, which is actually a really important job uh, because if too much of something goes into the cell, uh, say salts, or too much of something goes out of the cell, say water, that can be um, lethal for the cell. And then it also, importantly, allows for communi communication with other cells and with the environment. So for a unicellular organism, it is important for them to be able to communicate directly with their environment, and the way they do that is through proteins on their plasma membrane. Um, similarly, for cells that are part of a multicellular organism, they need to be able to cooperate both with cells of their other type in tissues and with cells of different types um, for in vastly different parts of the body. Okay, the cytoplasm. Uh, sometimes referred to as the cytosol, is also significant. Um, it is the watery jelly-like substance that's inside the cell, so it's what's, aside from organelles and other things, it's what makes up the volume of the cell. So it takes up space and gives the cell volume. It, without that cytoplasm there, um, it, you know, the cell membrane would not be pushed out. Okay? It can also act as a warehouse. So cells are in the business of making things, and in order to make things, they need the component parts, like atoms or other small molecules, and many of these can be found just in the cytoplasm. And it is indeed also the site of some biochemical reactions. For prokaryotic cells, the cytoplasm is the site of all biochemical reactions. But organelles also, or excuse me, eukaryotic cells have the organelles, and so some of those biochemical reactions occur inside the organelles. Next, we have the genetic material, which is also DNA. Okay, DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Okay, we're going to learn a lot about 
DNA later this quarter. For now, it's fine to just say that it stores uh, genetic information, okay? And it stores it as genes. So there's a little diagram, a little picture of DNA. DNA is really important because it directs cellular processes. Um, and so without the DNA, the cell doesn't know what to do and it dies. The DNA is really important. Ribosomes are these little molecular machines that are found in all cells, both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. They're actually, as this diagram um, is showing here, there are two component parts and when they come together they make the ribosome. That's not that important for you to know at this point. What is important is that their job is to manufacture proteins. Okay? Uh, proteins are an extremely important type of macromolecule that do all of the work inside cells. And we're going to be talking uh, at length about proteins um, and their structure later on this quarter. But without these ribosomes, we wouldn't have proteins and cells wouldn't be able to do work. Um, ribosomes can be located in a couple different places depending on the cell type. In prokaryotic cells, because there are no organelles, uh, all of the ribosomes are free-floating ribosomes in the cytoplasm. Whereas in eukaryotic cells, uh, there are some uh, ribosomes that are floating around in the cytoplasm, but there are some that also become attached to the rough ER and the nuclear envelope. Now these ones, the ones that become attached to the rough ER and to the nuclear envelope, we'll come back and talk about that because these are two organelles that we're going to talk about when we talk about the organelles that are found in eukaryotic cells. Okay, and finally, the last component that all cells have is something called the cytoskeleton. Um, cyto means cell, and skeleton, you know, means skeleton, same as our skeleton. So this is really the cell's skeleton. It's made of protein fibers, um, and it's a network or a scaffolding of protein fibers uh, that are found throughout the cell. So most diagrams, little cartoon diagrams, don't show uh, the cytoskeleton either at all or show it to the extent that it really um, actually takes up space inside the cell. So this does a better job of this. Um, both microfilaments and microtubules are types of um, protein fibers that are, make up the cytoskeleton. And here they're stained um, in different colors and it just shows you the extent to which these uh, cytoskeleton elements are found throughout the cell. Okay, And this diagram is showing here are some organelles, and it's showing that the organelles are actually attached to the cytoskeleton. Okay. So the cytoskeleton uh, gives the cell shape. Um, it pushes out the cell membrane along with the cytoplasm. It also allows the cell to move. I'm going to show you a video here in a second of a cell moving and going forward, and the way it does that um, is it pushes out its cytoskeleton. Um, so let me see if I can do a little drawing of this. We're not the world's best artist, okay? So here's a cell, okay? And all in here are, you know, it's just full of the cytoskeleton, okay? So say this, the cell wanted to move this way. Well, what it could do is use its cytoskeleton to start put going out this way and push its cell membrane, so this would no longer be there, push it out, okay? Um, and then as it does that, it would be also dismantling cytoskeleton back here and the whole cell will be crawling forward. Um, and that's what I'm going to show you a video of in a minute. Oops, I drew over my writing, sorry. Um, it also allows for movement of things inside the cell uh, using something called vesicles, uh, which we will talk about when we talk about um, organelles that are found inside eukaryotic cells. Okay, so for now I'm going to show um, this video it does have narration, and I'll try to make the sound appropriate. Um, I've had trouble with that in the past, so I'll, I'll try my best. I just want you to realize that this uh, video and all the videos that I play for you on the lecture videos are also available on our website under the Useful Stuff module. All right, so here we go. Oh, forgot that. It also guides cell division, and we'll be talking about cell division later, too. Ready. Let me get the volume up first. Neutrophils are white blood cells that hunt and kill bacteria. In this spread, a neutrophil is seen in the midst of red blood cells. 
Staphylococcus aureus bacteria have been added. The small clump of bacteria release a chemoattractant that is sensed by the neutrophil. The neutrophil becomes polarized and starts chasing bacteria. The bacteria, bounced around by thermal energy, move in a random path, seeming to avoid their predator. Eventually, the neutrophil catches up with the bacteria and engulfs them by phagocytosis. So there's the plasma membrane, okay, it's the leading edge, and the cytoskeleton is being quickly built. You can see how fast this guy moves, um, so it actually happens really quickly, okay. Um, and down here, you can maybe make them out a little bit, there's also flagella. So flagella and cilia are uh, ways that cells also move, and there's the flagellum and the cilia are extensions of the plasma membrane. Okay? This also illustrates something else that we talked about. Um, which is the ability of the cell membrane um, or the plasma membrane to interact with the external environment, external to the cell. Okay? So this cell is a white blood cell. Its entire job um, is to hunt down uh, invading bacteria or cells uh, that are invaded with a bacteria or with a excuse me a virus. And um, in order to do that, it has to sense its environment. Okay, so this bacterium. Um, is leaving behind it a trail of molecules that the uh, white blood cell can pick up upon um, and follow that gradient. Okay? And the way it does that is by having these specific proteins in its cell membrane. All right. My computer seems to be freezing. Oh, I hate it. All right, here we go. Eukaryotic cells um, are the other type of cells, um, and eukaryotic cells, remember, are more complex than prokaryotic cells. So we just talked about five things that both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells have. And now we're going to change and talk about things, um, components that are just found in eukaryotic cells. Okay? There are um, you know, kind of two basic types of eukaryotic cells, um, animal cells and plant cells. Now that is a oversimplification for sure because um, there's also fungi cells and protist cells. Um, and those actually are a little bit of in between. They combine both things that are found in animal cells and, and in plant cells. So it makes it a little less black and white. So for the sake of clarity and simplicity, we just talk about animal cells versus plant cells when we talk about eukaryotic cells. Okay, and of course, eukaryotic cells are different from prokaryotic cells in that they have organelles. Okay, and here is a labeled diagramming, diagram showing um, organelles that both uh, plants and animals have. And we're gonna go through and talk about each of these. And again, we're going to focus on the function, not on labeling a diagram. It isn't you know, significant to see what it looks like though, because always in biology, the structure or form of something gives it its functionality. Okay, so we will look at pictures and talk about that. And then we will also after we talk about um, organelles that are found in both plants and animals, we will then talk about structures uh, that are found only in plant cells. So in addition to everything that they have in common, plants have these extra four things. But first, before we go and in, launch into a discussion of what everything does, we better get straight on even what an organelle is. Okay, So an organelle um, is an inner compartment or subdivision inside of a cell. It is enclosed by membranes, or they are enclosed by membranes. So here's uh, something enclosed by a membrane. That's an organelle. Here's an organelle. This whole thing here um, is an organelle, and all this is an organelle. Okay. And then this is the cell plasma membrane. Okay. 
The really cool thing is that the membrane of the organelles and the membrane of the plasma membrane are more or less identical. Their um, main component, which is made of phospholipids that we are going to learn about later, um, are the same, whether or not it's found a membrane that's found around an organelle or found around um, the entire cell itself. Okay. The organelles have specific functions and this allows for multitasking tasking and complex functions for that cell. Okay. So because we have organelles in eukaryotic cells, we can make more complex organisms. Right? And as we see, many eukaryotic organisms, although not all, are multicellular. Okay? And so you can have cells that are specialized to do certain functions and form tissues, um, and a lot of that goes back to the ability to have certain organelles doing certain jobs. All right. All right, there are six organelles that are found in all eukaryotic cells. So remember we're saying all eukaryotic cells, that means both animals and plants have these, okay? um, but prokaryotic cells don't. Okay, the first is the nucleus, and this houses, um, houses the DNA. Uh, here is the nucleus, here is an animal cell, and here is the nu nucleus. It's shown larger in this diagram than in the nucleus that you'll see in any of the cells that we look at in lab. Um, just for the diagram's sake. Um, it's really important because it houses the DNA and its job is to protect the DNA. And the DNA contains the genetic information. It's what you might call the blueprint for life um, and it contains all the instructions for that cell to stay alive. Um, it is therefore very important. Um, if it becomes damaged, like mutated, or um, if it is lost altogether, then that cell will either malfunction or cease to exist. And it's so important that um, its membrane around it, this is just a, a membrane around the nucleus, it has um, its own name, it's called a nuclear envelope. Okay, so here's the nuclear envelope that goes around the DNA. Uh, chromatin is just another name for DNA, it's DNA that's highly packaged. Um, and then on this um, membrane, first of all we see these, these are pores, they're like little holes in the membrane. Okay? And that allows some things to, oops, don't do that. Um, some things to go out of the nucleus and other things to go into the nucleus. Okay? And then there are also here these ribosomes. So remember I said that some ribosomes are attached to membranes and sometimes they're attached to a nuclear envelope. If they're doing that then they're making proteins that are uh, necessary for the nuclear envelope or for the nucleus, excuse me. Okay, number two is the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, that's a mouthful so we often just say ER. Um, and this whole thing is an interconnected membrane system, and it's continuous with the uh, nuclear envelope, okay? So this diagram shows here, this is supposed to be the nucleus here, and then the membrane just kind of pulls off and then forms these folds, okay? And all of these folds are interconnected with each other. Um, this is just a cross-section of it, so you can see it, okay? And then there are two types of endoplasmic reticulum. There's the rough ER, um, that has ribosomes on it, and then there's a smoothie ER that doesn't. And we're going to talk about each one of these. Okay, so first of all, the rough ER. The rough ER is called rough because it has ribosomes attached to it. And when people first started looking through microscopes at cells, um, they could see this bumpy stuff, um, and they didn't know what the bumps were, so they just said that it looked rough. Okay, um, So it looks bumpy, and that's because it has uh, these ribosomes attached to it. Remember, the ribosomes are molecular machines, oh, that's just another picture that shows it, um, that make proteins. And so they're doing that also when they're attached to the rough ER. Um, specifically, um, the rough ER makes proteins that will be secreted uh, from the cell or become part of the membrane. Okay, so these ribosomes, oh, excuse, yeah, these ribosomes are making proteins um, that feed into this inside in here. Okay? and eventually um, they'll be then taken to the edge of the cell and dumped off. The smoothie ER doesn't have any ribosomes and its job is to make lipids like steroid hormones. Um, steroid hormones are examples of like uh, testosterone, estrogen, um, that kind of thing. Min this is minimal in most, most cells. Most cells don't have a lot of smoothie ER except those cells that are involved in making those hormones. All right, number three, we have this organelle called the Golgi apparatus. 
Okay, and the Golgi apparatus um, takes things from the rough ER, so R-E-R -E means rough ER. Um, it takes those things, those proteins that are made by the rough ER, and it sorts them, so kind of divides them up into different places or destinations of where they're going to go, uh, modifies, packages, and ships out the proteins. It's kind of like, I guess you could sort of think of it as a post office in a way, um, except for that it also modifies those things and packages them. Okay, so here is um, a picture of uh, the Golgi. It's, it's located right next to the rough ER, so all this here, all this area in here is the rough ER, okay? and that's because um, proteins that are being made in the rough ER, but often these things called vesicles, I'll talk about those in a second, and go over um, to the Golgi. They, their contents get dumped into the Golgi. The Golgi really is this um, kind of set of flat pancakes of membranes, okay? Um, and the contents get dumped in, and as they go through the Golgi, they become modified. Okay, that's the change of color is supposed to be indicating modification of the protein. Um, and then when they're finally ready, they get put into new vesicles and taken to their destination. Okay. Um, which brings us to vesicles. So vesicles are these small mobile organelles. Um, they kind of look like little bubbles, and they move along cytoskeleton tracks. Okay. So they actually uh, work with the cytoskeleton to move things around. Remember when I said that the cytoskeleton um, it allows for movement of things inside the cell? Well, it really requires these vesicles. So the vesicles are kind of like the trucks, or you can think of it as a train, and the cytoskeleton is like, sorry, is like the road, okay? Um, and then the proteins are like the, the things that are being moved, transports materials. All right, um, let's see where to look at that. Okay, so here's this diagram kind of puts everything together, okay? So first of all, um, we're looking at an antibody protein. Um, antibodies are made by white blood cells or neutrophils, just like that video we watched before. That's a white blood cell. Um, they go around eating up the bad guys, and but they also then make these proteins called antibodies that match parts of the bad guy, and, and they send those antibodies out into your blood and mark the bad guys for destruction. And so uh, white blood cells are making antibodies all the time, and so they have a lot of rough ER um, that's making the antibodies. The antibodies are going to be excreted or secreted from the cell, so they're going to leave the cell, and they have the Golgi. Okay, And then this here, this is a vesicle. Okay, So right, um, the ribosome here is going to make some protein, and that protein will then bud off in a vesicle and be carried. What this doesn't show is a cytoskeleton, so let's see if I can change color, color um, to a different color, maybe. Um, so remember there's a cytoskeleton that's all over here, right? And so this vesicle is going to move along the cytoskeleton, um, and it will then dump its contents um, into the um, into the Golgi. Okay, and then the Golgi is going to take those proteins, those antibodies, and modify them, um, and that's again shown by different colors, and then also sort them um, into different destinations. Okay, and then it'll repackage them into a vesicle, and that vesicle will then travel to the edge of the cell, and the cell membrane will merge with um, the, with the vesicle membrane. So remember. This part here, the cell membrane and the vesicle membrane, are made of identical material. Uh, so the vesicle can just merge with the cell membrane, and when it does that, it dumps its contents out. Okay, And the same here, right? So this uh, vesicle pinches off with the membrane, and then um, it just merges with the Golgi, um, and then pinches off again. Okay. Um, so, one thing to note is, say if there's a protein made for extinct, uh, for, uh, for being secreted, it's going to start in the rough ER, right, it's going to be made in the rough ER, and then it's going to go into a vesicle, okay, and then into that vesicle, uh, we'll move along the cytoskeleton tracks and take it over to the Golgi, where then it's going to be modified, and then once it's ready, it's going to be put back into a vesicle. And then finally, it'll be secreted. So it'll go to the, um, go to the plasma membrane for secretion. 
Okay, so I do expect you to understand and know this whole process here. All right, what do we have next? Okay, the lysosomes. Uh, lysosomes are also small, um, they're small organelles, and on diagrams they kind of don't look any different from vesicles, uh, but they are different because they contain digestive enzymes. Uh, they are important for recycling old molecules, so uh, building new large molecules like cells do all the time takes up a lot of energy. And so when the cells um, can recycle component parts, they do. Um, and they're also used for breaking down toxins and wastes um, before they can harm the cell. And in addition, they act as the stomach for cells that consume other cells or large particles. And this process is called endocytosis. And white blood cells do this. So that white blood cell that was chasing the bacterium um, and overcame it, um, it kind of goes on top of it and then brings that bacterium into the cell um, and then puts it in, gets it digested. And here, this shows that process, okay? Um, so here's the, it says food particle, but you could think of it also as a bacterium. Here would be the white blood cell. It's going to go over the, the bacterium and then incorporate it into this food, what's called a food vacuole, but it's really kind of like a vesicle. Um, it's a membrane bound with the bacterium inside of it. Then here are these lysosomes. These dots here are supposed to be the enzyme. They, um, the lysosome merges with the food vacuole and those digestive enzymes are put into, the, um, into that va food vacuole and then it could be, if it's going to be consumed, then the component parts would go out into the cell um, or it could just also be, um, just eliminate the wastes. All right, and that brings us to our sixth or organelle that's found um, in all eukaryotic cells, and it's definitely um, an important one. So mitochondria are the cell's powerhouses. Um, mitochondrion, it refers to a single one of these, and mitochondria are multiple. Um, we have a lot of these in places like our muscle cells. We have many mitochondria. Uh, because what they do is they perform cellular respiration, which is this complex process that we're going to get to learn about later this quarter, um, that converts the, the food that you eat um, into cellular energy, or ATP. ATP is a form of energy that cells can use um, to do work, so it's really necessary. All right, um, next I'm going to show you another video. Uh, this one has music that goes with it, but it's kind of dorky, so I'm going to turn it off. And then I'm going to try to narrate it for you. Okay, I might pause it during during it. Um, but so this is called. Oops, I don't know. Um, this is called the inner life of a cell, and it's kind of our best understanding of what it might actually look like in a cell. It's based on our understanding of what these structures look like and how they function. And so some artists and some scientists got together and made this. All right. Oh, I forgot to tell you one more thing. One more thing is that it's showing the inner life of actually of a white blood cell. Um, and so it's first going to be shown in a blood vessel because white blood cells are found in white um, in blood vessels. And then it's going to show what's happening inside the cell, presumably as that um, as that cell travels around the blood um, and incorporate, you know, starts making antibodies and that kind of thing. Okay, so the blue tumbling phase, those are the white blood cells. Everything else is red blood cell. That's the outer part of it, um, and those are proteins that allow to crawl along the edge of the inside part of the blood vessel. That's the cell membrane, um, and those, so I'll, that's like a raft sitting on top of it. And these are all proteins that are membrane proteins. This part, those long stringy things, those are uh, supposed to be the cytoskeleton, and the blobby things are more proteins, and then that shows more of the cytoskeleton and the blue backgrounds, um, the cell membrane. Those are also part of the cytoskeleton. It really gives you an idea of how much uh, room it takes up inside of the cell. And here's part of the cytoskeleton being built, perhaps to push the cell in a certain direction. And there it is being cleaved or broken apart by an enzyme, perhaps to facilitate stopping building it and there's another kind being built in a certain direction and there it is being taken apart at the lagging edge. This guy is great. Let me just pause it for a second. Okay, so what is this? This is the cytoskeleton 
and this is a vesicle. Remember, cytoskeletons and vesicles work together to move things around the cell, specifically uh, proteins that have been made in the rough ER. This guy here is actually really important. It's a motor protein, and what it does is it provides uh, the ability to move the vesicle along the track, okay? And I know this looks really cartoony and really goofy, but this is actually how it happens. So on uh, the cytoskeleton, there's these grooves and uh, these little feet on the motor protein fit into them. Um, it takes cellular energy in the form of ATP to make this guy walk, um, and that causes him to translocate and take a step down, um, down the cytoskeleton carrying his big old load. That's part of the cytoskeleton also called the uh, microtubule organizing center. And let's see, okay, this is the nuclear envelope with the pores in it. And coming out of the nuclear envelope are strands of mRNA um, that are then going to be read by a ribosome. Remember, ribosomes make proteins. And what they do is they read the mRNA and make a protein. And then this particular protein is hooking up with another protein that chaperones in it and takes it into the mitochondria where it's going to be put to work doing something. Here are the ribosomes that are docking on the rough ER and feeding the protein into the inside of the rough ER. Then they're getting, um, they're budding off in the vesicles where they are then moved to the Golgi. And there's Golgi. There are vesicles merging with it, dumping their contents into the Golgi where the contents are modified. And then they are then taken by vesicles to the edge of the cell and released. So notice how some of those proteins were released and some stayed in the cell membrane. So there are a lot of proteins that are part of the cell membrane and that's how they get there. And then these guys have a bunch of proteins and then they're gonna lift their heads up and grab a hold, okay? presumably to help the cell attach to the outside and perhaps flatten. And what it's gonna do is gonna dive between two of the cells that are lining uh, the blood vessel, chasing after some kind of bacterium or virus, perhaps. So there's a lot going on inside of cells. And I hope you got an idea of that. Now let's see if I can get this guy to go forward. Don't know why it's doing that, but it's kind of driving me crazy. Go. Oh. All right, so we have just covered uh, the six organelles that are found in all eukaryotic cells. And then I remember and both plant and animal. And then plants, remember, have a couple extra things that aren't found in animal cells, okay? So now we're gonna go through those. So not in animal cells. Uh, the first are chloroplasts. These are the green organelles. They make leaves green and they do photosynthesis. Uh, photosynthesis is a complex process uh, where plants take carbon dioxide and water from their environment and also light energy and use it to make glucose. Uh, glucose is considered to be the starting point for food, um, so the plants make their own food. They also make oxygen as a byproduct which we can breathe in. Um, so this process is really important. It's all due to this lovely um, organelle. We are going to learn about photosynthesis later, just FYI. Okay, the second is something called the central vacuole. It is a very large water-filled organelle. Okay, this diagram doesn't really do a good job of showing that. Um, really, uh, this takes up most of the space here. Okay, and all the other organelles like the nucleus and the chloroplasts, not doing a very lovely job drawing. This thing is hard to draw with are stretch or just around the edge here. Okay, we're going to be looking at elodia cells and you'll kind of get an idea of that when you look at the elodia cells. Um, so it takes up a lot of the volume and it has multiple functions, okay? First of all, it provides structure uh, with a cell wall. So I'm going to explain that. I'm gonna tell you in a, the next slide what a cell wall is and then I'll explain how the central vacuole cooperates with the cell wall to create structure. Um, it is also used for waste storage, okay? It can be used for waste storage and structure at the same time. Isn't that cool? 
Um, so all product, all uh, cells make waste byproducts. Um, plants don't have a complex circulatory system like animals do, um, and so they don't have an easy way to get rid of waste necessarily. But they do have this handy dandy central vacuole. The central vacuole is surrounded by this plasma membrane, okay? and that means that there's a barrier between what's inside the central vacuole and what's inside the cytoplasm. Um, and so waste products, even those that could harm the cell, can be sequestered away inside of uh, the central vacuole and not harm anything. Okay. Additionally, toxins are often stored. Sometimes those toxins are metabolic waste that are also used as toxins, um, and sometimes the toxins are purposefully made. Sorry about that circle. If I try to erase, it's going to make the whole slide go forward, so I'm just going to leave it. Um, <clears throat> This is an example of a plant called rhubarb, which is edible if you cook it. Um, it has calcium oxalate crystals in it, and that's what this is showing. Um, it's really faded here, but this is supposed to be the outside of the, the cell here. Okay. And these are just found in the central vacuole, so that means the central vacuole is taking up most of the space of that cell. Okay. And this would be found in the leaf. Uh, calcium oxalate is a toxin, um, so if you're a caterpillar and you're coming along and you're eating that plant, you would get a mouthful of calcium oxalate and that would kill you. Um, for humans, it gives us a kind of a nice sour taste that we like a little bit, um, but if you eat it raw um, or eat too much of it, uh, especially the leaves, then uh, it can affect you also. And then finally, the central vacuole can be used to store pigment. Okay, and we're going to see this uh, in our lab when we look at the purple onions. Um, the onion skin that is purple has that purple coloring stored inside the central vacuole of the cells, as does this rose. So these are the um, cells of the rose petals, um, and you can see that they're almost entirely red. Okay? Um, and that is because the, the red coloring is stored in the central vacuole, and the central vacuole takes up most of the space. All right, next up is the cell wall. So this is not an organelle, so don't get confused about that. The cell wall is not an organelle. It's a sturdy structure, um, kind of, you know, like um, an outer coating, like a hard shell. And it's made of cellulose. Cellulose is a carbohydrate um, that actually we can't um, digest. Um, so things like grass and wood are made almost entirely of cellulose, and we can't eat those, even though it's a carbohydrate. Um, the, the cellulose cell wall is found external to the cell membrane. So um, the cell membrane here would be this line on the inside here, and then the cell wall is this area in between. Okay. Um, it's, you, it can be of various thickness, so some cell walls, like found in uh, trees, in the wood, have very thick cell walls, um, but other cell walls of, say, plants um, that have that are soft, like for example, uh, banana fruit is a very soft fruit. It's still a plant, so it has a cell wall, but it's really thin. Okay. Um, and like I said, it um, works to uh, provide protection. Uh, I didn't say that before, but it does because it's a hard shell. Um, and also um, provides structure with the central vacuole. So how does that work? Um, okay, so the central vacuole is in here, and really, this isn't a great diagram, because really it would take up, you know, this much space, right? Or not out there. Um, and then here's the cell wall. So what happens is the central vacuole is just plump full of water, and that pushes out on the um, cell and causes it to form a nice plump kind of a brick, okay? Plants um, need sturdy cells so that they can grow tall. So here's a tree, for example. Trees are just made of cells. They don't have bones that keep them up. Um, and so they need sturdy structures. Um, and they, one way they get that is by um, making their central vacuole full of water and it pushes against the cell wall. And those two combined makes a very strong cell that can then be used to stack, okay? Um, so like if you eat celery, for example, and it crunches, that crunch is from all those turgid cells. Okay. On the other hand, if you leave your celery um, in your refrigerator too long, then it can become dehydrated, and in which case the cell, uh, the central vacuole becomes um, really dehydrated and, and little, and it no longer provides that turgor pressure against the cell wall, and that's when your plant wilts or when your celery becomes rubbery. You can, of course, um, 
you know, reverse this by putting it back in water or watering your plant, um, and then you can get turgid cells again. Okay, finally, uh, the last component that are found in plant cells are these really cool organelles um, called plastids, and they have a flexible function. I'm going to talk about two different types of plastids. Um, one are called chromoplasts, and these are for pigment storage. So this is a different type of pigment than I showed you before that was um, found in the rose plant. Uh, these are actually little organelles, so it has nothing to do with the central vacuole, um, that have just pigment in them. Okay, So if you could look closely at this red pepper, um, you would see that the redness is caused by these small um, chromoplasts, these small organelles called chromoplasts, and same with this petal. Okay, So this petal has yellow chromoplasts. Okay, and then we'll also uh, see uh, uh, plastids that are specifically for starch storage. Starch um, is a carbohydrate that humans and other animals can use as a source of energy and uh, plants use starch to store energy for later. Uh, so this is a banana cell, banana fruit cell. We're going to look at these in lab. This is the cell wall with the cell membrane and then these things are the amyloplasts. They're just full of starch um, and it's a way for the plant um, to either store starch for later or store starch in a fruit to get an animal to eat it. All right, and that concludes everything you need to know about cells and their components.